Alright, Benji. Just wants the cast to be wiped out in a single game, and it's for reasons like this, as well as the series of excessive sex and violence. Oh, and by the way, uh, graphic content warning for this video. The Gans game is reputation as an overtly edgy series, and it is. This adventure, I love as a teenager. As a kid, I had my perception of media and reality obliterated by the shocking and violent. Uh, I spent a lot of my teenage years trying to How are you doing? Feel, no, no, which led me to shows I'm like Life and Lead, Tenge, and of course, Gantz. But this side of Gantz has also drawn a lot of criticism. I've seen more than one person argue that this is a series of unmitigated trash. And while I actually can sympathize with those criticisms, as you can guess by the existence of this video, I do think there's some genuine heart to this series and that is how we talk about today. And to do so, I want to start with the man behind Gantz, Hiro Ogun. Hiroi Ogun is a strange fellow. After the ending of Gans was heavily criticized on the Japanese messaging board 2chan, he included a scene in his next manga in Yashiki, where an evil cyborg teenager murders every member of the online messaging forum. He has a very distinctive approach to storytelling, often focusing on the cruelty and violence humans are capable of and presenting it with a near nihilistic cynicism, as seen in Gans and each of his followers. But what's interesting is that he wasn't always like this. In fact, his first manga, Hen, was a comparatively light-hearted Ichi drama that found success in Weekly Young Jump magazine. However, things would then take an unfortunate turn. Oku using the profits he'd made from Hen to invest in cutting-edge 3D technology, spending two years and all his money training himself and his assistants in the new software, in the hopes of creating a new kind of 3D manga. The only problem was that this was the mid-90s and 3D software still had a long way to go, and so his resulting manga 01 in part looks like this. Zero One was cancelled after only three volumes, leaving Oku without income and on the verge of bankruptcy. And I have to wonder if the desperation of that situation contributed to the eager tone of Gantz, and perhaps why its struggle for survival feels so real. Because for Oku, it was. This is criticism that runs through every part of Gantz, never more apparent than in its main character, K. Corona. And Corono kind of sucks. He's cynical, isolated, and bitter, having separated from his family with no friends or anyone he can even adopt. And because of this, he's grown apathetic and cold, only seeing other people for how they can benefit him, and abusing the trust other people place in him. And because of this, it's very easy to dislike Corono, especially in Gans's early chapters. But after a little while, what becomes apparent is that he's a product of the world around him. Corono's school, for example, is presented as this Darwinian nightmare where older students so violence and humiliation among the younger peers. One particular early story arc involving an upperclassman known as the dentist, who tortures his classmates by ripping out their teeth and collecting them. This is the world of Gantz. It presents society at its most bleak and callous, and because of this, it's easy to see how Corona has become what he is. How the life and enthusiasm he had as a child has been crushed out of him, leaving a cold, cynical shell of a person. And in understanding this, it gives us a believable baseline from which we can watch Corona grow over the course of the story. And that's a quote that starts when he's drawn into the game of Gantz. While being summoned by Gantz is initially a very bad thing that forces Corona to face unimaginable horror, it also does something else. It shatters Corona's isolation, forcing him into contact with the other participants of the game. Their only hope for survival would be to work together to overcome whatever danger the night brings. And so, slowly, 
Over the course of the games, people start to rely on Chrono, and he in turn begins to rely on them, the group sharing a bond that is absent from Chrono's ordinary life. It is a chapter that illustrates this really called daytime lantern, which starts with one of Chrono's teachers calling him a daytime lantern, i.e. that he is totally useless. The name catches on in a way that names tend to in high school and he spends the rest of the day being harassed and insulted by his classmates. But then that evening, he's visited by his teammates from Gantz, who come to look at him as a leader. And together, they bound across rooftops and train for whatever challenge awaits them in the next game. The chapter ending with Chrono staring silently down at the people he's helping. What's so cool about Daytime Lantern is how it captures that feeling of being part of a found family. That in his daily life, Chrono is this no one who is harassed and ignored. But through Gantz, he's found this group of people he's really important to and are important to him. Letting him grow past the selfish asshole we met at the beginning of the story. And what's cool about this chapter is that no one is so day in Chrono's life, and let's come to our own conclusion. And this is something I really like in Chrono's work. He's a much stronger visual storyteller than he is an um, actual storyteller. Often there's very little direct detail about his characters' lives, but revealing who they are, either through their environments, the subtle emotion of their facial expressions, or taking an entire page layout and using it to convey a particular concept or emotion. He has an ability to visually capture a moment and use that moment to give us further insight into who these people are. One of my favourite examples of this comes at the beginning of Gantz's third major story arc, the first panel of the page showing Corono lying in bed. The isolation he feels conveyed by the empty, negative space around him. The next panel revealing his desire to go back to Gantz where he can be with other people. But then immediately, this layout is contrasted with the third panel, showing Gantz's secondary main character, Kato, in the same composition. But that negative space is filled with his little brother, Kato racked with anxiety over having to return to the apartments. What I love about this page is how with just four simple panels, it shows us the vast difference between these two characters and the impact Gantz is having on their lives. Unlike Corono, Kato has something to lose, his little brother. Both Kato's parents were killed in an accident when he was younger, leaving him and his little brother in the care of their violent, abusive relatives. And so, all the two have is each other, Kato taking it upon himself to get a job and save up enough money to rent an apartment, where he and his little brother can live in safety and peace. But because of this, his relationship with Gantz is totally different from Corono's, as he knows that if he's killed, he will vanish from his brother's life without explanation, leaving the child alone and defenseless in a cruel, violent world. This page capturing that anxiety beautifully. And it's for moments like this that I would really recommend the manga of Gantz over all other versions, as well as the fact that it's the only way to experience the vast majority of the story. Okay, you may have noticed from that previous section that Gantz is bleak. Really, really bleak. But part of what makes it such a strange series is that this is only one side of Gantz. The other being that it's totally fucking insane. And to help illustrate this, I'm going to bring back one of my favorite sections. Here's a few out of context moments from Gantz. One of the later battles involves our heroes being attacked by Salvador Dali's 1936 Cerritos painting, Soft Construction with Water Bees. There is a cute frog who steals people's shoes, who is also a nightmarish hell creature. One of the participants of Gantz is a panda who forms a loving and meaningful relationship with a serial killer. George Clooney is there. This panel happens. And finally, one of the aliens encountered her. This panel happens. And finally, 
as one of the aliens encountered the robotic version of the 1970s Japanese folk singer Seiji Tanaka, who sings his songs in a creepy robotic voice and is piloted by Jean. Awareness in the head.